Great, but if you'd like to take up your Bibles, and um, if anybody hasn't got one and needs one, just wave a hand and, and one will find its way to you. And if you could turn to the book of Hebrews, um, which is on page 849, I think we're on, 849. And um, we've been working our way through uh, this book of Hebrews on Sunday mornings during this term. And we're just going to look at the first six verses of chapter three this morning. We're going to um, just look at this in three, three sections just for a few minutes um, the first, uh, this morning. The first thing we're going to see is the call of this writer um, to fix our thoughts um, on Jesus and the big call at the beginning of this passage. And then we're going to see him uh, tell us about the faithfulness of Jesus to the one that sent him into the world. And we're going to see that in that he's like Moses. So Moses was faithful, Jesus was also faithful, and yet Jesus is worthy of greater honour in the sort of middle section. And then the final section we're going to see this morning is really a call for us as Christians to hold firmly uh, to our confidence and hope that we've placed in him. So that's where these six verses are going to go. Let me just read them to you. Hebrews 3 verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful to all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honour than Moses, just as the builder of the house has greater honour than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. And we are his house if we hold on to our courage and the hope of which we boast. So this chapter begins with a great call by the by the writer to fix our thoughts on Jesus. Um, but as we said two weeks ago, there's a wonderful description of the Christian just in this first um, verse or so. Do you notice Christians are described as holy brothers? Uh, they're described as those who share in the heavenly calling, and then they're those who put their who acknowledge or, or confess Jesus as their apostle and as their high priest. I think it's worth just sort of starting with that great reminder um, this morning that for those of us that have put our trust in Jesus personally, uh, this writer describes us as being holy. Um, We're righteous in the sight of God. We're pure in the sight of God. And we said two weeks ago that, you know, we know if we know anything about ourselves, we know that probably the word holy or righteous is not one that we would take to describe ourselves. When we know our hearts, we know that the way that we live And yet, we saw in chapter 2 that Jesus is both holy and the one who makes people holy. And so as Christians, if we put our trust in him, we are holy in the sight of God because of Jesus and all that he's done. And we are those who share in the heavenly calling. Uh, We have a future. Jesus has come to bring a kingdom that will go through death and on into eternity. And as Christians, we are those who share in that heavenly calling. We have a wonderful future to look forward to. We're also described as those that confess Jesus and acknowledge Jesus as our apostle and our high priest. And again, he's picking up on stuff we saw in chapter 2. Jesus is the sent one. That's what apostle means. God sent him into the world. And we, we believe that. We confess that. We see that God's hand was involved in sending Jesus to us. And he is our high priest. We saw again two weeks ago. The high priest is the one who represents people and goes into the very presence of God on their behalf, bringing the sacrifice that can bring people and God back together. And we confess Jesus as our high priest, the one who came into the presence of God and brought a sacrifice to pay for our sins. So that's a wonderful description at the beginning of chapter three of of those of us that are Christians, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling. Fix your thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and the high priest whom we confess. But in the middle of that verse is is, um, a verb. And I don't know um, how you were at school with English and things. I wasn't very good at English. Um, I was 
my English teacher, back in the day, before GCSEs, we were the last year that didn't, like before GCSEs, there was a GCE O-level and a CSE, which was the sort of the layer below. You know, my English teacher was thought probably the CSE would be more suitable for me. So I sort of begged and pleaded for a bit, and they agreed to enter me for both. Uh, thankfully, I did scrape through the O-level. Um, why am I saying that? Oh, yeah, verbs. Um, <laughs> so, yes. So in, in the middle of that first verse, we, we're called to fix your thoughts on Jesus. And for those of you that are into your English, that verb there is an imperative. So it comes with the force of a command. And often the Greek writers will use um, different types of verbs. I forget what they're called now. But the imperatives are well worth sort of paying particular attention to because they're coming with a, with a sense of a command. Fix your thoughts, Christian. So if you're here in this building this morning, and if you put your trust in Jesus, and you are described now as being holy because of him, and you share in the inheritance, and you claim him as your apostle, God sent him, and he's your high priest, and the writer's saying to you, and to me this morning, with a real sense of force and command, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Uh, somebody's described the verb that's used here, as to, or to, to explained it as, to direct the mind towards something and to reflect on it. Direct your mind towards Jesus and reflect on him. Or give careful attention and consideration to the Jesus that you confess. And I guess in a way that's illustrated, isn't it, by what we're doing here this morning. This Sunday every year is, is set aside, isn't it, in in the calendar, we, we stop. We, there's a build-up to this day. We, we will buy poppies. There will be television programs. There will be things perhaps that we'll read in newspapers and magazines. We begin to think about what people have done for us in the past, the sacrifices that have been made. And then today is set aside, a chunk of this morning set aside to, to, to deliberately direct our minds towards and reflect on. To give careful and attentive consideration. That's what this verb means. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. And he's calling Christians to do that. Seems odd, doesn't it? But he's calling Christians to fix our thoughts, our minds on Jesus. And one of the things that we'll see next week when we complete chapter 3 is that the word today is going to become very prominent now in chapters 3 and 4. So in chapter 3, it's there in verse 7, verse 13, verse 15. It crops up again a couple of times in chapter 4. Today, 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 today. So the, the beginning sort of urge of chapter 3 is for Christians to fix their thoughts on Jesus, to direct their minds towards him, to reflect on him, to give careful and attentive consideration of Jesus. Today, 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 today. It's to be sort of woven into the fabric of who we are. Um, and I think we need to therefore consider how do we help ourselves to do that in the midst of, of, of the busyness that is sort of pressing in on us all around from all sorts of sides. How do we direct our minds today? Carefully consider today. Fix our thoughts on Jesus today. Maybe good for some of us to think about some daily kind of prompts or things to actually weave in to our day. Just as today is woven into our calendar to sort of weave into our day some kind of prompt to, to think on him, to fix our thoughts on him. Uh, that can be, again, we've talked before about Bible verses, maybe there may be a verse a day you could take, a verse that can ping up. Now, a lot of us have phones that could be scheduled couldn't it, to ping up in the lunch break or at the end of the day, the beginning of the day, something to take our minds back to him. You'll see why in a minute, why this is so important. Later on in chapter 10, the writer will urge Christians to not give up the habit of meeting together. Again, because the purpose of that is to encourage each other, to remember, to fix our thoughts, to fix our minds on him. In fact, if you have a look at chapter 3, it is in our chapter as well, verse 13. Uh, chapter 3, verse 13, he says, But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And again, we'll see this again and again in Hebrews. We need daily reminders to fix our thoughts on him. And we're to encourage each other to be doing that. So this morning, I was going to, a little bit of a challenge for us to think about. When we gather, it's clearly a good thing in Hebrews because it's part of this reminding and strengthening each other. We're to gather to encourage one another. 
And I think obviously by us being here together is an encouragement. But I think probably a great thing to just add into our minds that when we gather, we're gathering together that we might encourage each other, as long as it's called today, encourage each other daily to keep going, to fix our eyes on Jesus. It'd be a great challenge on a Sunday morning think, when I come in, who can I encourage today in some way to fix their eyes on Jesus at the moment? Maybe in a, in a particular struggle or a, a difficult circumstance that's happening. It may not be. But who can I encourage today before I leave to fix their eyes on Jesus? When I turn up at growth group, in amongst all the other good things that growth groups do, to actually go to that house with the mindset of who am I going to encourage today to keep fixing their eyes on Jesus? Um, something that I think we're keen to do as we move into 2020, to maybe think a little bit about prayer partnerships and triplets, one-to-ones, just ways in which we can be encouraging each other. I wonder, like even the challenge, what about texting someone every day? Someone different in the church. Just some line to encourage them to fix their eyes on Jesus. Um, and, and notice, and we'll say more about this next week, so we really will try and bed down into the practicalities of this. But it, it doesn't... The mindset isn't that as we come together, our mindset isn't, I wonder who will encourage me today. The mindset is, who am I going to encourage today? And the theory goes that as every one of us actually prioritizes the encouragement of others, we hope and pray that that encouragement will go around and everybody will feel encouraged in the process. But it's something for us all to own. Fix your eyes, fix your thoughts on Jesus uh, the apostle and high priest that we confess. It comes with a force of an imperative. Now the second section I'm going to try and literally cover in two minutes because I will come back to it next week. And it's this thing with Moses. And I say we'll give more time to it next week. But I'll reread it. But let me give you what the headlines are as I just go through verses 2 to 6, sort of slowly reading it to you. The big point of 2 to 6 is that we're focusing on Jesus, who the author wants us to know is faithful to to the one who sent him. And he wants us to know that Jesus was faithful to the one who sent him, just as Moses was also faithful. And yet, he says, Jesus is worthy of greater honour than Moses. That's what's happening in these next few verses. Um, We're going to see that Moses was a faithful servant in all of God's house but that Jesus is the son over the house and the builder of the house. So do you get the idea? They're both worthy of, of honour, but Jesus is worthy of greater honour, and you'll see why in a second. So let me just read it to you again, having said that. So we're called to fix our thoughts on Jesus, the apostle and high priest whom we confess. He was faithful, and faithful's cropped up several times in chapter 2. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honour than Moses, just as the builder of the house has greater honour than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, testifying to what would be said in the future. But Christ is faithful as a son over God's house. I'm reading a book at the minute, and it's just sort of, Trying to think of just another way of just illustrating what's being said here. And it just covered a couple of pages ago yesterday, uh, somebody who'd taken over a, a sort of fairly run-down hotel that I think belonged to his father uh, many years ago. Took over that hotel and, and did it up and so on. And um, it, it became a very profitable little thing. I think it's in Austria. This is set in, the, in the, the mountains or something. But over the next 10 years, that person then had done up a few other hotels in this area and then had a number of these kind of hotels in the mountain ranges of a number of different countries. So sort of 10 years on, this sort of owner of that one house has now built an empire, if you like, of great hotels. Now, there may well be people that serve in those hotels and even run individual hotels who are incredibly good at what they do and faithful as servants, if you like, within that one hotel or that cluster of hotels or something. And their faithfulness can be commended and is a good thing and a great thing to be celebrated. But they're not the same as perhaps the person who started with the one and has built this entire empire. They're both faithful in what they do, but this one is worthy, as it were, of greater honour. And that's, that's the sort of sense of what we're seeing in this passage here. Moses, a man of God, used by God in an incredible way in the Old Testament, and and the law came through Moses and so on. He was faithful to God, a faithful servant in God's house. But Jesus, a 
And if you've been here during this series, you've already seen somebody with, with the angels and so on. But Jesus is the sun over the entire house. God, it says in this, in this passage, is the builder of everything. And actually, we've seen in chapter 1 that God made the universe through the sun. So there's a sense in which, so in no sense is Moses being downplayed here. Absolutely no sense. But he's not, on, he's not an equal. That's a sense of what we're getting at, at the beginning of chapter 3. Christ is faithful as a son over the entire house. And in fact, verse 5 says that Moses, even in his writings and so on, bore witness to the son who would come in verse 5. So I'm going to leave that there. We will touch back on that next week. But Jesus then is the one that we're to fix our thoughts on is Jesus, who is faithful to the one who sent him, just as Moses was, yet is worthy of greater honour than Moses. So we'll come back to that, and you'll see in a minute why the the author's done that. So as we move into the final section, verse 6, God has built a house. And look at the wonderful news at the beginning of verse 6. Christ is faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house. Wonderful, wonderful words, aren't they? That God is building this house, this sort of um, entity, if you like, that is made up of people. And it's made up of people who have trusted Jesus as their apostle, as their high priest, as the one that would stand, as it were, in the breach for them. The house is made up of these people. And so if you're a Christian here this morning, again, verse 6 is talking about you. You are the house that God is building. You are the house for whom Jesus has come to die. Again, we'll be thinking much today about those that have sacrificed themselves for others. And Jesus stands, doesn't he, as the ultimate, the greatest example of this. That he came to a cross. He came to a place where judgment from heaven fell upon him in order that we might be protected. He turned aside God's wrath. That was his role as high priest turned aside God's wrath from us and bore it himself. We are his house. But I want you to notice a little word um, in verse 6. It's a little word, if. Christ is faithful as a son over God's house and we are his house if we hold on to our courage or confidence and the hope of which we boast. I became a Christian at 13 and a half, December the 23rd, 1984, um, at probably about half past eight in the evening. I made the decision that I wanted to become a Christian. And in becoming a Christian, I acknowledged before God in prayer my sin, my wrongdoing, uh, my treatment of him as being wrong. I, I, I acknowledged my need of rescue. And I asked on that night Jesus to forgive me and to be my saviour. And I accepted him as my Lord, the one that I would pledge myself to follow. I put my confidence in him, my trust in him on that night. And my hope for the future, for his dealings with me, for for the um, heavenly calling, my hope for the future was firmly rooted in him. And verse 6 says that, that Christ is faithful as a son over God's house and we are his house if we hold on to our courage or confidence and the hope of which we boast. And verse 14 puts it even more clearly. Chapter 3, verse 14, it says that we have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. Christian testimonies and uh, stories of how people became Christian are absolutely wonderful things to hear. Um, We had a stage in the life of the church here where we had somebody different every week to come to say about how they became a Christian. It's amazing to see the way that God has worked in our lives, and it's a great thing. And the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, I think at least three times, tells about how he started out as a Christian and what God did in his life. But I'm going to tell you that you're going to hear as we go through Hebrews... The same note being struck again and again and again by the author. As the author is going to say to you and me several times, are you still holding on firmly? How's the race going? How's the Christian life going? How are you now, 
Chris, I haven't done the math, so I can't quickly work it out. 1984, I put my confidence and trust and my hope in Christ. The writer of the Hebrews says, that's wonderful, Chris. That is wonderful. Praise God. Are you holding on now, today? Are you still trusting? Is your confidence still rooted in him? And if throughout this letter... The reader's going to, the writer's going to ask this again and again and again. And he's been doing it already. Chapter 2, verse 1. He said, pay the most careful attention to what you have heard so that you do not drift away. Or 2, 3. How shall we Christians, who he's writing to, escape if we get to the point where we ignore so great a salvation? 3, 1. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. Imperative. You need to. Today, today, today. Verse 6, we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and the hope in which we glory. Now in terms of the original readers, if you've been here for a few weeks, you'll be beginning to pick this up now. In terms of the original readers, their temptation is actually to, to drift from the finished work of Jesus and begin to drift back to the law of the Old Testament, the rules and the regulations, the systems, perhaps even priests and and visible things, temples and and so on. Their temptation, and we'll say this, we'll pack this out more in in the future as well, there's other reasons, but there's a strong temptation to go back. And part of what underlined the sort of glory, if you like, of that thing they're tempted to go back to, is that the law came, as we've said, you can almost say it now, via angels. It was so significant. And the law was given to Moses, the hero of of, of our faith, the man of God, the faithful Moses. And so all of these things, in a sense, underline the, 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 the rightness or the feeling of rightness to drift back from the finished work of Jesus, back towards this thing that came by our angels, and to Moses. And so the author's been saying in these early chapters that Jesus is so superior to the angels that the angels worship him. So don't leave Jesus on some sort of basis that there was angelic activity. The angels are wonderful, but they worship Jesus. And Moses was an incredibly faithful servant in the house of God. But Jesus is the son over the house. Jesus is the builder of the entire house. So he's urging his first readers, don't let go of your confidence and your hope in Jesus. Don't shift. As long as it is today, fix your thoughts, fix your mind, fix your heart on him. Don't drift. Now, maybe that there, are the, there may be some of us who are tempted to, to, to sort of drift as they were. I think for something that they could see, something that they could handle, something they could touch, to bring back some of the rituals and, and the regulations and so on. There's a sense of confidence in those things because they're visible and they're seen. But I think probably most of us in this room were tempted to go back, not to Judaism, but back, I guess, to the world in which, that we've come from. To a world that promises contentment or pleasure or security or freedom or satisfaction. Tempted to look there instead of to him. I want to just finish with the words of Peter actually. Um, I'll just read these to you from John's Gospel. Jesus' ministry, Jesus' life and work, as you read through the Gospels, um, there are times when the crowds are enormous. And people can't get enough of Jesus. And there are times when they are actually leaving him and deserting him. And there's these wonderful words actually at the end of John chapter 6 where um, we read it in verse 66 of John 6. From this time, John says, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. It's a sort of a wonderful exchange, isn't it? Even as people are leaving Jesus and deserting him in John 6, Peter says, to whom will we go? 
You have the words of eternal life. You're the Holy One of God. So whom would we go? Any choice to go anywhere else, to put our confidence anywhere else, our hope anywhere else, is a step backwards and a step down. There can be no comparison, says Peter. Where would we go? Where would we go? The writer of the Hebrews is saying to all of us this morning, holy brothers, holy sisters, made right and with Christ, purified by him, Righteous in God's sight because of him. Those who share in the heavenly calling, the inheritance that he has, the future that he's prepared, the mansions within the mansions within the mansions and so on, of of the the inheritance he's won, you are sharers in. You've acknowledged him as the apostle, the sent one of God. You've acknowledged him as your high priest, the one that has stood in the breach in your place and bore the wrath of God in your place that you might be forgiven. Well, if that's you... Hold your confidence and your hope to the very end. Keep fixing your eyes on Jesus. Keep running the race. Don't take your eyes off him. Don't look anywhere else. You've started the race well. I was thinking, so, you know, it's probably only on you have been framed, isn't it, that you see people that fall over at the beginning or whatever. It's the people that finish the race that we remember. It's the one that gets over the line at the end that we remember. It's the one that keeps going to the end. So the writer is saying to them in the first place and to us, don't look anywhere else. Keep running, keep focusing, and you need to do it today. So today, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Fix your attention there. Pay careful attention to him. And when you wake up in the morning, don't rely on what you did today. You need to do it again tomorrow. And when you wake up Tuesday, you need to do it again if you're going to keep running to the very end. Let me just pray and then uh, hand back to Simon. Father, we thank you for this letter to the Hebrews. We thank you, Lord, that it is medicine from you. It's words, Lord, that we need to hear. We pray for one another this morning, Lord. Help us uh, to encourage one another. Help us to take on that task this morning of seeing it as part of our responsibility, Father, to encourage others and to spur one another on, uh, Lord, to love and good deeds and to focus on you. Father, help us to think as we leave this place this morning, how we're going to safeguard our tomorrow when it becomes today, how we will fix our eyes. Lord, help us to grow in strength, grow in confidence, to keep our hope in the Lord Jesus. And take us and use us, we pray, for your glory in this week ahead. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.